it's good to be back. And there's more faces here than there were last week, so I'll just reintroduce myself. So my, my name is Ray Jean. Uh, I live in the Sioux, though right now I'm working as a carpenter, mostly on St. Louis Island, so around the area quite regularly. Um, and it's just been, uh, it was fun last week to come up and to come to Calvary Baptist. My first time, my first time here was last week, so it was nice, it's nice to, to come back again and to um, give me the opportunity to preach again. Um, go to a, a quick bit of review, because I thought since I, I was given two Sundays in a row, why not try and tie, tie the two messages together in some way? So if we're going to do that, um, a bit of review of last week is helpful to, to kind of set the stage for what we're going to try and do this morning. So last week we looked at Luke chapter 20, uh, one, uh, a famous story of Jesus, where a bunch of people come to him and they ask him, do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And, and the, the answer is famous. Jesus asks for a denarius, a Roman coin, and asks the people whose image and likeness is on it. They say Caesar's, and Jesus' response was, well, then give to Caesar that which is Caesar, and give to God's that which is God's. Now, we last week spent time really dissecting that answer, jumping in, well, trying to answer the question, well, what, what is God's? And if you apply the same test that Jesus applied to the coin, it's people who are made in the image of God. It's people who bear his inscription. So give, give yourself to God, since you are made in God's image. And I thought, well, let, let's take this sermon, well, let's take this idea, and we'll, we'll come at it from a different angle this week. Um, uh, so, I'm going to spoil the end, of, the end of the sermon. We're basically going to end up the same place we ended up last week. We're just going to take a different path to get there. Uh, today, we're going to try and, and look at the image of God as, as, an, as a concept, as a whole. And usually, I like to when it comes to preaching, I like to find one passage and just kind of sit down and like park there. Uh, but today we're going to take kind of a bit more of a shocking approach and we're going to hit some major, major scriptures throughout the entire Bible dealing with the image of God. Um, might have bit off a bit more than I can chew this morning. We're going to find out. But, but that's what we're going to try and do. Look at, at what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And how does that affect our lives here and now? So, before we begin, let's just open in a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for another morning to, to gather as your church body to worship in, in, in song and praise Lord, to, to God who's so deserving of, of all our worship and adoration. Lord, we pray that, that from the very hearts of who we are, we'd worship you in spirit and truth. Um, and that as we open your word, your Holy Spirit would be here with us, transforming us and, and changing us. Lord, we, we don't want to leave the same people that we came in. Lord, we want to look more like your son, more like Jesus. Um, that our, 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 our lives would be a reflection of his, uh, his character, his goodness, his love, and his mercy. And that those around us would see Christ within us. Lord, that is our prayer. Uh, and we just we, we pray for your help in accomplishing this this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So a couple of years ago now, um, which honestly, it feels like a lifetime because this was, this was pre-COVID. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was living abroad in, in just outside of Nairobi, studying at a little seminary there. And it was an absolutely wonderful life experience. I, I really enjoyed that time of life. I, I made some really good friends uh, in the process uh, of living in a different country. The um, two friends, though, really stuck out. My last year there, uh, the people who were there with me before, they had gone home, so I, I was going to have a potentially lonelier year that year and wasn't sure what was in store. So I landed in Kenya, and, and a new couple from the UK were there that year. And we, we instantly just got along. Helen and Josh were their names, and uh, we became really good friends. And... You know, one of, the, one of the common things that united us is we had a relatively similar background culture. We were both Western culture, living in an African culture. So, so that in and of itself, you know, we found some commonality right away. Uh, and it was just, it was really good to have just really good friends to, who understood you and you could talk with. And since we became so good friends, you start to do a lot of stuff together and you start to share your hobbies. And Josh was, um, 
he was a really good photographer. And I was, I've always been interested in, uh, in the hobby of photography, even though, ironically enough, I always hated having my picture taken. In my, my teen years, I took great pride in ruining many a good pictures by like covering my face or obscuring, <laughs> obscuring my face if someone tried to snap a picture. Uh, I probably took a little too much joy out of that. But, but I was, so I always hated my, having my picture taken, but the idea of photography always intrigued me. And, and since I spent so much time with Josh, I started to learn a bit about photography through him and kind of started to get sucked into the world. And all of a sudden I was looking at camera bodies and lenses and, and realizing that one does not casually wade into the hobby of photography. It's like you plunge in, it's a mile deep. And all of a sudden you're talking about focal lengths and apertures and it's like it's, it was overwhelming, but it was, I enjoyed it because it, it married science through lights and optics and stuff like that and, and technology with, with art. And I found it was just such a, such a fun, fun blending of two different fields. And as I bought myself a camera and a few lenses and started to look online at some tutorials of how to become a photographer, I quickly realized that there, since the beginning of photography, there was this debate of like, what is the purpose of a picture? And the purists would argue that a picture is to be taken to, to represent the moment in the most pure, accurate way possible. So that if you take a picture of something, you're trying to capture that moment in as much truthfulness to that moment as possible. The other side argued that, no, photography is an art and that you can play with your picture to express something far more than just what was happening in that moment. That you can tell a story through the pictures you tell. Ironically enough, one of the first like photoshops happened very, very early in the history of photography. Someone spliced a bunch of images together to make something that hadn't exist, but was expressing something that he wanted to express. And, and so this like philosophical debate I really enjoyed, like, because it, it, it shapes the way that you will then start to take your pictures. And I kind of leaned more towards the side of using photography as an art of storytelling, even though I'm not nearly good enough to do it well, most of the pictures I take, I just delete. Um, but it got me thinking, like, what is, what is the point of a picture? What is the point of an image? What's it supposed to do? And then naturally, that kind of rolls itself forward into the topic we'll talk about today, since we are made in the image of God. What does that mean? Are we supposed to be exact representations of, of God in the most pure, truthful way possible? Or is there something else that we artfully tell about the character and nature of God? So, so that's kind of where where my mind started to go when I got into photography is, is how do I take a picture and what am I trying to say? And then since I, I like philosophical thoughts and perhaps think a little bit too much, it naturally, it naturally lent itself to thinking about spiritual things. So, so the image of God, we, we all know that as human beings, we are created in the image of God. And we're going to go this morning, start off in Genesis 1 and looking at the very beginning. So Genesis 1, I'm going to read two verses off the hop, verses 26 and 27. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our likeness and let him rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So right at the start of the biblical story, we, we come in just barely a chapter in, and God's created man and women, mankind, and, and instantly, you know something is different about this act of creation. God has paused and, and taken time to say, we're going to make mankind in our image. That's a profound statement, but, but what does that mean? <laughs> because how we interpret that really shapes a lot of how we go about life and, and our thoughts about who people are and what we're supposed to do. If we have 
a warped idea of what it means to be the image of God, that's going to play itself out into every aspect of our life. So we want to try and get this right. In order to get stuff right, context is so helpful. So, so we're going to build, build, build a bit of context to what's going around so far in, in Genesis 1. And the great thing is that since we're at the, real, the very start of the Bible, there's not a whole lot of context we need to build. Um, God, God starts off, right? Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, we probably all quote this verse. In the beginning, God created. God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void. Now, now this is important. The, these words, if you go to the Hebrew, it's kind of fun because the Hebrew writers actually, like, they rhymed these two words together, formless and void, because uh, the Hebrew writers are brilliant with their, their writing and they, they often wove like poetic and, and rhymes and stuff together to, to emphasize points. And the best, the best translation that I've heard to express this uh, comes from a podcast I listen to called The Bible Project. And what they, they've kind of used this idea of rhyming and just say like wild and waste. That, that God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was wild and waste. Meaning like chaotic and devoid of life. And that's where it starts. And at the very, very beginning of creation, we see God start to do something. He starts to not just create the world, but he brings order to the world. So that the world is created. And what does God do? He separates light and darkness. Order. Light here, darkness there. Before it was chaotic. We see there's sea and land and it's chaotic and mixed. And what did God do? He brings order to it, splits it. Here's the sea, here's the land, here's the boundary point. God brings order to creation. And then once he brings order to creation, it's still devoid of life. So what does he do? He starts to fill it. He starts to fill it with life. The skies that he had ordered, put the stars and moon in motion, everything that he had planned were empty. So what does he do? He fills it. Fills it with birds, fills it with life. The seas and the land, which were empty and void, what does he do? Plants and, and animals and, and everything that lives, God fills it. And then we get to Adam and Eve, creation of man. And God says, we're going to make man in our image. And he, so he does. But then it, it's, it's what happens next that's also really important. Because if you keep reading... In verse 28, God says, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Fill the earth and subdue it. If we were to, if we were to restate that, basically what God is saying is, I want you to continue the work I was doing of bringing order and bringing life. And that's your mandate. Uh, he, God started it off by by creating and ordering and filling everything. And then he creates man and says, here's your mandate. Fill the earth and subdue it. Calm it. Cultivate it. Bring order to it. Continue in what I was doing. This is, I, I think, absolutely amazing because it, it really, I don't think you can take this idea away from the image of God and the mandate that God gave man. Because if we, if we look at just Verses 26 to 27, God created man in his image and in his likeness. Well, what, what does that mean that I and you and all of us somehow resemble some physical attributes of God? Maybe. Like, maybe. Because you get further into the Bible and you, you hear you read stories in Ezekiel where Ezekiel sees visions of God and it talks about like having an appearance like a likeness of man. So it's like yeah, there's some sort of similarity here between mankind and God in some sort of physical way, but we also know that, that God's spirit and, and is far transcendent than just fingers and hands and toes and knees and, and everything else. So I, I don't think the main point of what, what's being written here is that we somehow physically look like God. I think it, it, goes, it goes a fair bit deeper than that. And that's where we want to try and, and get to this morning. So let's, let's put that on the back burner right there and let's let it simmer because we're going to add a few other things to the stew, if you will. We're going to jump over to Psalm 8. 
Psalm 8 is a Psalm of David, and he is musing upon man's position in the created order. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who has displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mothers of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God and crown him with glory and majesty. You make him rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep, oxen, and also beasts of the field, and birds of the heavens, and fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You can just imagine David here sitting out, I'm not sure what point of life this would have been. Maybe he's still a shepherd, sitting out in the field, looking at creation around him, realizing that all creation is silently singing a symphony of praise and just declaring the handiwork and the, and the power of God by just being in existence, that the stars and the moon and the sky are just showing the grandeur of God. And David, just being blown away by the majesty of creation, then becomes introspective and says, what is man that, that you even consider him? But despite the fact that he, he sees man as so unworthy of, of being considered by God, he also realizes the fact that, that, that God made mankind in a special place of honor and glory. He even says, you have made him a little lower than God. That's the New American Standard Bible translation. Likely some of your translations will say a little lower than angels. Fun translation issue is that the, like the Hebrew word for, for God and for gods with a small g is the same word, and that's context that determines where which way you're going. Um, I tend to lean more, more towards what David is saying here, is that you have made man a little lower than the other divine beings, the other angels, the other created order, the other spiritual beings. I think is what David's getting at. That, that in the, the hierarchy of creation, God sits supreme at top. And then you have his created angels, those divine, divine beings, if we want to call them that. And then just under that is mankind. And then you get all the other living creatures and cattle and beasts and everything else. And David is saying that you, you've put man in a position of glory and honor. And not only that, that you've, you've, you've subjected all of creation to under his feet. That's a, that's a wild statement when you start to think about it. And, and I think this directly ties back to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God talking to Adam, well, talking amongst himself about creating man in his image and giving Adam and Eve a mandate to rule. So we have Psalm 8 here talking about and shedding light on, the, on what it means to be the image of God. We have Genesis 1 doing also the same. But also, there's a bit of cultural background that we can build into this to really help bring some clarity of what it means when the writers of the Old Testament talked about us being created in the image of God. Israel didn't grow up in a cultural vacuum. They, they had kingdoms and, and, and peoples and nations all around them. And the culture of everyone in that time, like it, it flowed. So thoughts that happened over here flowed into Israel, and Israel thoughts flew, flowed out and, and influenced nations around them. Like it wasn't isolated. And the idea of an image of God was not something foreign to the nations around it. In fact, they were quite comfortable with it. The difference was is that they would consider their king or the ruler to be made in the image of God. That, that he is the direct representative of the gods. He has divine power and authority to rule. That he is the one who the gods have chosen to rule in their place 
on earth. That kings were semi-divine, for lack of a better, better word. And, and that they were the, the emissaries, the, the, those who, who worked out the will of the gods here on, on earth. Um, and, and they even built like statues and, and images to, to also represent that. An interesting fact is when you read through the Old Testament, the word image most often is associated with idols something that images God and uh, a God and represents their authority and their rule and their power. That, that, that nations would set up images of, of their kings or images of their gods to represent, here's the authority of this God, here is the rule of this God, and, and we are to obey that rule and that authority. So, so it wasn't a foreign idea in that time for a man to be created in the image of God. But what was scandalous about Jewish thought about, about the Old Testament is that every man and every woman, woman was made in the image of God. That, that was something radical. From the king to the farmer and everyone in between, all of them, all of them bore the image of God. All of them were to be his representative to work out his will, to work out his plans and his purposes. And that's, that's what's radical about what's being written here in the Bible, that you and I, made in the image of God, given a mandate to rule and to subdue the earth and to bring order to it, in doing so, we live out the plans and the purposes and the desire of God who created us in his image. That is what it means to be made in the image of God. That we are the representatives, representatives here on earth of his divine will and power and authority. And that we are obedient to his plans and his purposes that he has called us to. And we see that in Genesis 1, given a mandate right off the bat, rule over creation, subdue it. Fill the earth with life. That is what God wanted from mankind. And this is this is a thing that has blown my mind when I've actually come to realize this, because it doesn't make sense to me. I, I can get I can understand God creating mankind in his image, but when you look at God and his character in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there's this, this propensity of God to want to share in his reigning, that he likes to co-reign and delegate authority to other people. And that blows my mind because he could do it so much better if he just did it himself. But he chooses to bring people into the picture to reign with him, to reign over the world with him. And that plays out over and over and over again in the Old Testament. You see it in Genesis 1. Adam and Eve were to be the images of God. God works through them and with them to accomplish what he wants. You fast forward through and then you see that regularly, over and over and over again, God chooses to work through human agency. He didn't just snap an ark into existence. He got Noah to build it. He didn't just create his own nation. He worked through Abraham to establish it. He didn't just declare his own glory to the world. He worked through Israel as a nation to do so. And this happens over and over and over again. And I don't understand why, because every time God works with people, people screw up the plan. Like every single time. That's, that's basically what the biblical story is about. God gives Adam and Eve a mandate. They drop the ball. They say, we want to be God. We want to do everything ourselves. We don't want to rule with you. We want to rule by ourselves. So they eat of a fruit. You see, Israel, supposed to be God's representative nation here on earth, they say, we don't want to serve God and follow all these laws. We're going to do what we want to do, do what is good in our own eyes. And that's the story of Judges onward. Like, it, it's the same story just played out in different contexts over and over and over again. God tries to work with people. People screw it up. <laughs> Why does God keep trying to work with people? I don't, 
I don't know. But it, it also reveals such a wonderful quality of God that despite the fact that he is big enough, strong enough to not need us to do what he wants, he still chooses to work with us to accomplish his plans and purposes. And like, talk about patience. Like that, that's, that's amazing. But, but we also realize that there's a bit of a, a problem that immediately crops up in the Bible, that, that since man regularly keeps trying to rule in his own place without God, the image of God imprinted on us has become broken and distorted. That's, that's the story of the fall, and that's a story that plays itself out over and over and over again throughout the entire Old Testament. And this is part of the reason why Jesus' is coming is so absolutely amazing. We often, we often just talk about Jesus' is coming so that he could die on a cross to forgive us our sins and that we can go to heaven, right? But the, the, the gospel message is so much deeper, richer, and beautiful than just that. So Jesus came as, as a man living the perfect life in obedience to the plans and the purposes of God, doing what the image of God was supposed to do. Perfect obedience. Fulfilling the role that, that no one in history was able to fulfill up to that point. Jesus did it. He stepped into this mandate, this calling of, of being an image, the representative of God, to, to be the one who works with God, who accomplishes his rule and his desires and his plans here on earth. Jesus filled that perfectly. And then that's why you get into verses like you find in Ephesians. I'm just going to read a few verses here. This is a, a, a Pauline prayer praying for, for the saints in Ephesus. Ephesians 1 verse 18. I pray that the hearts that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the suppressing greatness of his power to us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. David in Psalm 8 is musing over the fact that, that God put creation in subjection to man underneath his feet. Man really boggled that up. They dropped the ball on that. So, so what does God do? Because he sends Jesus. Jesus lives the perfect life that we couldn't live. He is the ideal image, the ideal representation, the perfect representation of God. So that now everything is put in subjection under Jesus' feet. The role that you and I couldn't accomplish, Jesus does. He is the image of God. He is the exact representation of the character and the nature of God. He is the one working for God's plans and purposes. He is the one fulfilling the role that we couldn't play. And then so you think, well, then what is there left for us to do, right? We're home free now. We don't have to do anything. But, like, but no. And this is, again, where, where God's grace and patience is astounding. Because then you keep reading on in Ephesians that he in Christ raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. That's past tense. He's already elevated us to a position of glory and honor in Christ. For what purpose? So that we would do his will, his good works that he has planned before us. You jump over to 2 Timothy, where it talks about how if we endure, we will reign with him. That that God hasn't cut us out of his plan to co-rule and to be a part of this world. But that we still currently, through Christ, can step into that. And we also have the future hope that we will reign and rule with him in the future. 
Why? I, I don't know. I don't know why God chooses to so regularly bring us into his plans and his purposes, but I think it's absolutely amazing that he does. So to be created in the image of God, we are created to live out the will and the purposes and the mandates that God has given us. That is our purpose. That is the reason for our creation. So then, I think this is a good time to ask, what does that look like from a practical sense? Because you can talk about you know, image of God theology and it's all up here, but unless you bring it down to a, a real day-to-day -day level, what good is it? What good is it to go around saying, I'm created in the image of God and your life is the same as it was yesterday? It, it really isn't. So what does it mean for us nowadays that we are made in the image of God? I think, I don't think, I know, the Reformation had, had some really good effects that it brought about. Um, one of the main points of the Reformation was um, Luther started to talk about how it wasn't just um, within the church that you could find a divine calling. One of, one of the tenets of the Reformation, one of the, the important parts that that brought about was how everything we do can be a divine calling. That you didn't just have to be, go become a priest to, to work in the will of God, to do his, his works. But and this is to quote Luther, you could sweep the streets and do so in a way that is in line with God's calling and, and brings glory and honor and worship to him. How everything we do in life can be done in a way that expresses God's plans and his purposes and aligns with his will and his desire for us. This is, this is what Paul talks about in Ephesians. God has prepared good works for us to do that we should walk in them. He has prepared plans. He has prepared purposes. He has prepared his will for us that we in our daily lives could walk in those good works in so doing image God. And notice, this is where the, the word starts to become a verb, to, to image God. It's not just a state of being, it's an action in the way that we live. We image God in how we act, in how we react, in how we, how we love, and how we go about life. So that, so that now, every aspect of life can be used to declare the character and the glory and the nature of God. From from how you raise your kids to how you do the dishes to how you drive to work, all of which can be mundane and seemingly pointless, but, but can now be used to express God's plans and his purposes and his will, the way that we conduct ourselves with each other and with God. From the smallest little deeds of, of our daily lives and how we handle them to the, to the big things in our lives and how we go about our jobs and, and choosing what vocation we will do and, and where we go to school and all that, all of it. Because Jesus has fulfilled it and we are now in Jesus. All of our, all aspects of our life can be brought into subjection to God's plans and purposes. And in doing so, we image God and show the world around us his character, his glory and nature. We bring order and life to the world. It's such a, an amazing calling that we've been called into. How God can use every aspect of what we do for his purposes and his, his glory. So when we, we, we think back to last week, how, how since we were created in the image of God, Jesus is saying, then give yourself to God. We're just coming back from the different side now is, since we're created in the image of God, everything we do reflects his character and who he is. And that we can still reign with him here on earth as we work in his will to see his plans accomplished. Again, I don't, I don't understand why God handicaps himself to working through people 
he could do so much better if he just just you know, cut us out of the picture and did it all himself. But yet, yet somehow he derives glory and worship from us when we bring our lives in subjection to him and desire to, to make his name glorified and known through our actions, through our conduct, through our behavior, through our work, through our thoughts, through all of it. That that is praise and that is worship and that is glory. It's such a, a fulfilling thing to be a part of. There's a heavy responsibility that comes with, with being made in the image of God. I want to reflect that image well. I want to bear that image well so that people around me see God within. I don't want to re- misrepresent his character, his nature, his intentions, his plans. And, and have people looking at my life and become confused as to who God is. I don't want that to happen. I want, I want every aspect of my life to clearly declare and proclaim who God is, what he wants, and what he's like. It is a weighty thing to be made in the image of God, but it is also a fulfilling and marvelous thing. So my my hope, my prayer, my desire for, for myself, for you, is, is to, to live in an awareness that, that every action we do can represent our God. That by being made in his image, we have been given a responsibility, a mandate to represent him, to, to live in his will, to live his will out, and, and to to declare his power and his authority to a world around us. We do it in love, we do it in grace, we do it in a way that reflects the genuine character of God. Because we're made in his image. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you're so patient with us. How Lord, we don't even have to go to the Bible to look at stories of how people have messed up your your plans and your purposes and keep dropping the ball, that our, our lives themselves are our testimony of our failures. Um, and yet, in your grace, in your mercy and kindness towards us, you still patiently work through us and in us and with us. Father, I pray that each one of us would continue to yield our desires and our spirits and our our, our wants and our dreams to you, um, that we would place them at the foot of the altar, knowing that that you are so worthy of, of our complete surrender. And that in doing so, our lives would be just a, a, a symphony of praise and worship as we declare to a world around us who you are. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.